So welcome everybody to this fantastic talk from Sally today of uh, Asana Through the Ages. And I will hand over to you now, Sally. Thank you, Angie. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, good. Right, so Asana. Um, I thought this was going to be easy because it's just one eighth of the eight limbs. Um, so yeah, no big deal really, um, except that we're covering about um, 3000 years, maybe even 4000 years. So um, without more ado, we'll start. So Asana, um, it's the third of the eight limbs and literally in Sanskrit, it means seat. As, A-S, means um, sit or remain. So it's traditionally, um, particularly in olden times, viewed as a seat for meditation, for pranayama, for various religious purposes. So it's, asana is not just a posture. It's not a pose. Um, that's more the modern view of asana. Um, so it has a kind of a, a, a serious and a um, spiritual purpose. Um, so what are the earliest types of asana that we have evidence for? Um, going back a long way, BCE, um, the first evidence we have is, and it may be evidence, it may not, um, is from the Indus Valley civilizations. So Angie, if we could have those images, the Indus Valley. Um, the thing about the Indus Valley civilizations is that it was a, a flourished between 2700 BCE and 1700 BCE. And there was a script, but nobody's deciphered it. And there are images only. Um, it was along the Indus Valley, which is in northeast India, between what's now Pakistan. Ah, here we go. Between what's now Pakistan and India, and even uh, I think going into Afghanistan. And the, it was only discovered that there were all these ancient sites about 100 years ago by a British um, archaeological surveyor. And at the time of partition, um, there were only two sites in Pakistan that were known, um, Harappa and Mahenjo-Daro, and one in India. They've now discovered many more, as you can see from the map. Um, so these were ancient cities laid out on a grid pattern. Maybe we could have a picture of one of the cities now, Angie. Um, so they're laid out on a grid. Um, they would... Um, possibly ha have um, several thousand people um, made of mud brick, grid plan. Um, it seems to have been a very egalitarian society because there are no vast um, structures, nothing that suggests temples or royal palaces. Differences in size of the houses, but not a great deal of difference. Tremendously sophisticated um, planning they had um, indoor sanitation, they had baths. I think that in the foreground is a water tank. Um, yeah, they had baths. They even had ventilation using the Bernoulli principle, particularly for that turret you see at the back, that raised building, where there was an opening at the bottom, a tube that came up through it and out the top. Um, and the pressure in the lower part of the tube was higher the pressure at the, at the highest part of the tube was lower, so that drew air through. Um, and I learned that from Chris Packham. That's how prairie dogs ventilate their um, burrows. Amazing. By building little mounds and, and having these tubes that run up through them. Um, and let's see another picture of Mahenjo-Daro. I think there's another Mahenjo-Daro. Yeah, and then let's, now they had artifacts that were found, um, what no, seemed to be no weapons of war, no religious artifacts, no sign of any burials or um, wealthy burials or significant burials, possibly everybody was cremated. Um, 
and tiny seals. So let's see our first seal. That's not the, the um, creature. That's um, similar to the ones you get in the Near East um, with cuneiform. Um, so they're about the size of a postage stamp. They were carved into soapstone, which is very soft, and they were carved and then they could make an impression. So it's like a mould, and then you could press it onto wax or wet clay to put your mark on something, or some of them had little holes drilled in them so that you perhaps could have a cord in it and carry it around your neck. Lots of them show pictures of bulls or unicorns. That's that strange writing at the top that hasn't been deciphered. Um, let's see another. The cow was obviously very important to um, the Indus Valley civilization. Um, oh, an elephant. And notice also the swastika symbol on those um, little cubes above. And then let's move on to the next one, Angie, which is a seated figure. This is why I, want, I wanted to go through this rather quickly. Um, oh, now here we are. This is another of these. Some people call them unicorns and some people just think it's a cow in profile. Um, they are beautiful, aren't they? We think how intricate they are given the size. Seated figures, that's the one, lovely. Right, so this is a seated figure. Um, is it significant? We've no idea because we can't read the writing, um, but it looks to us like a, a yogic posture. Uh, the symmetry uh, could be Badakonasan, maybe. And then I think there's another one coming up. So I'm, I'm rushing through these rather because we don't know um, if, if they are asanas or not. That's taking asana posture um, to, to be um, symbolizing something spiritual significant. So this is sometimes called the Pashupati, the Lord of the Animals. A little cluster of animals around him. So we don't know what to read into it. And then there's one more, which is a bit tricksy because this is actually from what's now Germany at the time of the Roman Empire. Um, so much, much more recent, but it's quite similar, isn't it? Um, yeah, I like that one. Okay, thanks, Angie. That's the first batch. That's um, Mahenjo Taro. Um, so, as, uh, given that there's no text to go with it, we've no idea what those positions signify. And we have to wait quite a long time before we get anything that um, we can be sure is um, a yoga asana, um, a yoga posture. Um, so the two earliest strands of physical, physical posture, asana, um, from very early on, we know that people sat for meditation um, and we also know that from um, a good few hundred BC, um, they also took a static posture as a sort of a mortification to mortify the body, um, to overcome the body, to attain release from reincarnation. And the idea of um, motionless austerity was for one thing, you're not creating any more ripples, as it were, any more imprints on the mind that will have to be resolved before you can escape from the cycle of reincarnation. Um, so not doing anything meant that you weren't um, uh, doing anything wrong that had to be compensated for. And also the motionless austerities would burn out karma, the principle of cause and effect, and release you from the cycle of rebirth. Um, now the first um, recorded um, spiritual practices were from the Jain period. So we have the first Jain picture, Angie. Um, the Jains practiced non-violence more than anything else. That was their supreme thing. Some of you may have a picture in your mind of them wearing masks because we're all being good giants now. They wore masks so that they didn't swallow um, insects by mistake and 
harm them. So here we are, someone wearing his mask. And you may not be able to make out the writing, but he's got five yamas written on the branches of the tree, which are um, ahimsa, non-harm, satya, truthfulness, ahimsa, satya, asteya, non-stealing, brahmacharya, um, sexual continence, and aparigraha, non-grasping. So our five yamas were already around in the time of um, the great Jain masters. Obviously, this is a modern picture, but it's um, reflecting something that goes back to, well, there were supposed to be 24 Jain masters. The 23rd is recorded as having been about 850 BCE. And the last, the 24th, is said to have taken up a squatting pose, Utkatikasana, just one more syllable than our usual, Utkatasana. So if we could have the next one, which shows Mahavira, the great um, giant master, in Utkatikasana. Actually, from later texts, that's actually the milkman pose, because later texts, which we'll see in the medieval period, Utkatikasana is described as squatting with the buttocks on the heels. And then if you come up on your toes and lift your heels off the ground, then it's called the milkman pose. And he's reached um, Samadhi, but he's reached Samadhi by um, fasting to death. And the Jain masters did, did do that, apparently, that um, once they felt they'd reached um, the attainment of the right state that they could break the cycle of reincarnation, then they could fast and were glad to die because then they'd be released from the constant cycle of death, rebirth, suffering. Um, and then we come on to the Buddha, about 500 BCE. Um, and one of the ways that the Buddha tried to um, escape from suffering was by um, mortifying himself in the same way. And this isn't a contemporary, obviously a, a not a contemporary carving, but it's just kind of to imprint on your visual memory, this idea of the Buddha, ha the Buddha having starved himself to a very gaunt um, state of um, being. Um, but he then decided that this wasn't the way, that it was the wrong path um, and, uh, he achieved enlightenment release um, by other meditative means, so mental control rather than mortifying the body. Um, and seated asanas are established in the Pali Canon, that's the Buddhist scriptures. But they also did um, various um, static but challenging poses like raising the arms in the air and keeping them there, standing up endlessly, um, or like Mahavira, the giant, last um, giant master, difficult squatting poses, and something called the bat penance, um, which I first heard about, and it was just hanging upside down in ropes, and I thought, oh, rope sheer shafts, and that sounds great. Um, so if we could see the next picture and see if it actually is as great as it sounds. Um, oh. I don't know if we can flip him, head down, feet up. Angie needs to be head down, feet in the air. We'll get there, that's it. So you can't quite see it in full, but he's hanging by his feet and he's hanging over a burning fire. So the idea was that you um, hung upside down over a fire again, to, to mortify the body. Um, okay, and then if we could, that's obviously a fairly modern engraving. Um, and the next one is um, a coin representing Alexander the Great. So I'm galloping because there's a lot to get through. Um, so Alexander the Great came through Northern India in around 400 um, BCE. This is a slightly later coin. It was actually minted after his death by the next um, Greek ruler. But there he is, his horns um, denote his affinity to Amman, one of the Egyptian gods, because his, um, 
his sway was from Egypt all the way through to North India. Um, now, he was in the Punjab, and his entourage observed naked ascetics who came out from the town at the beginning of the day, and they were lying or sitting or standing all day in the full sun. And two of the men were invited to dine with um, Alexander, but they insisted on taking their meals standing up. Um, and one of them lay for the rest of the day, they must have had lunch, I guess, not supper. Um, he lay naked in the full sun and rain, and the other stood on one leg, raising a piece of wood three cubits long. Um, a cubit, I think, is about sort of forearm length, so three forearm lengths. It was, you know, it wasn't a, a twig, it wasn't a stick. Um, so um, that's evidence of the um, uh, record, actually recording these um, uh, ascetics. Um, okay. Oh, uh, one thing to note is that the Greeks had an influence on the representations of the Buddha. It, uh, the earliest representations were just uh, like imprints of two feet, so it was just his his footprints on the earth. And some people postulate that it was the Greek influence that led to later carvings, later statues of the Buddha, draped with pleated um, robes, very much in, in the Greek style. Um, so moving on, the first Sanskrit um, references, um, the Mahabharata, Mahabharata, uh, which is a heroic um, epic, not dissimilar to the Homeric epics. Um, describes ascetics doing inverted upside down poses, holding up, um, standing on one leg or holding their arms in the air. Um, so this is around 200 BCE. Um, but enclosed within the Mahabharata is the Bhagavad Gita. And I want to read you what the Bhagavad Gita says about um, austerity. So it says, uh, this is chapter six, um, good place to start um, because it's very much, um, it's called the yoga of meditation. Um, so yoga is not eating too much, nor is it not eating at all. And it is not the habit of sleeping too much and not keeping awake either, Arjuna. This is Krishna, God Krishna, talking to Arjuna, one of the five Pandavas, who's about to go into battle, who's not looking forward to it, to say the least. For him who is moderate in food and diversion, whose actions are disciplined, who is moderate in sleep and walking, sorry, waking, yoga destroys all sorrow. As a lamp in a windless place does not flicker, to such is compared the yogin of controlled mind performing the yoga of the self. But there's also a verse here which I'd like to read to you, which Gita was very fond of. She quoted it a lot. Samam kaya shiro grivam, holding the body, head and neck erect, motionless and steady, gazing at the tip of his own nose and not looking in any direction. Remember that about gazing at the tip of the, the nose. We'll see in some of the later images I'm going to show you that there's a... Um, they look fierce because if they're shown in profile, the eyes look as though they're rolling, but actually they're doing this thing. It's like squint, not squ yet yeah, squinting when you bring your eyes closer. It doesn't sound very relaxing. Um, oh, it does also tell you about the seat you should sit on. Sorry, I forgot that. Not too, in a clean place, not too high, not too low, covered with a cloth, an antelope skin and kusha grass. So that's the recommendation of the Bhagavad Gita, which is probably the single most important text for Hindus down the ages. Um, so that's the Mahabharata. Uh, oh yes, the words actually used are stiram asanam. So those of you who know your Patanjali will know that Patanjali describes asana as stiram sukham asanam. And it's for the purpose of shantim, peace, nirvana, um, bliss, or um, uh, liberation. 
paramam, utmost, so it's for, to attain the utmost peace and bliss. Um, so these austerities that I talked about, which the Bhagavad Gita is obviously um, decrying, advising against, did continue. They were accepted in the tradition of the Brahmins um, and continue almost up till the present day. I, I believe if you go to the burning ghats in um, Varanasi, you'll still see um, uh, yogins doing just a single posture and holding it, even if it looks to us very strenuous or difficult. Um, so we come to the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. What is Patanjali Yoga? Um, it's a means to escape the pains of worldly life, to gain control of the mind and the senses, to attain realization of God or soul, which is spirit, permanent, unchanging. So we have the eight limbs, we have the yamas, which we've already seen are shared with the Jain faith, and the niyamas, and then we come to asana, and uh, potentially only has three sutras about asana. So I think in one of my previous talks, I said something about how strange it is that we've adopted Patanjali as our um, following in the path of Guruji, of course, um, of BKS Iyengar, um, taken Patanjali to our hearts, although he says so little about asana. Um, so the first sutra, um, which I have written down, but I think I have it from memory, stira sukham asanam, asana is stable and pleasant. Um, so we saw already in the Bhagavad Gita, it's stiram asanam. Um, so it's an agreeable posture, an easy posture. Prayatna shaitilyananta samapatipyam. Um, through release of effort, you attain the infinite within or without, it's not specified. And tato dvandva anabhigataha. And um, it gives us the means to overcome the dualities um, so pain, pleasure, gain, loss, success, failure. Um, so the other thing to know about the sutras is that everybody um, wrote commentaries on them, including um, BKS Iyengar. Um, but the very first versions of the Yoga Sutras that we know of, the first and oldest texts, all have the same commentary. And there's a, there is a theory in academic, particularly Western academic circles, that the first commentator, Vyasa, was actually the same person as wrote sutras, that it was more like expounding, expanding the ideas. Um, and Vyasa kindly provides a list of 12 named asanas, plus a little phrase, etc. Um, and they all appear to be seated or possibly supine. Now, some people suggest that these different seated postures in the way that we do see, you know, we do Viras and Siddhas and Padmas and Dandas, and that they bring flexibility to the limbs. Um, and then that makes sitting for meditation, for contemplation, makes it easier. Um, and when was Patanjali? Well, Indian scholars put him pre BCE, around the same time as the Bhagavad Gita. Western um, academics put it much later third to fourth century um, of the current era. Um, so what's this list of poses? I'll read them out to you. Padmasana, Virasana, Bhadrasana, Svastikasana, Dandasana, Sopashraya, Haryanka, Kramchani Sadhana, Hastini Sadhana, Ushdrani Sadhana, Samasamstana, Stirasukha, and then the etc. is Yatasukha, which does, does literally mean etc. And then um, the commentator also says kindly, this is Vyasa, Padmasan is well known, so he doesn't bother to describe it, although later commentators who comment on the commentaries do describe uh, the, the asana of Padmasan, you know, lotus pose. And then Virasan, if any of you um, are able to and don't have bad knees, you could try this. Um, a sitting man has one foot in contact with the ground and places the other over the partially inclined other knee. 
So it doesn't sound like our virasan, does it? We'll find that virasan comes up in all sorts of forms, including turning out to look rather like Padmasan. And then a, a later commentator, Shankar, Shankaria describes it as one of the legs is bent and the knee of the other leg is placed on the ground. So do try that if you'd like to. Um, Badrasan, a sitting man places the soles of both feet joined together beneath the testicles and places both hands with the fingers interlaced over that region. And Shankara has it right foot on top of the left and the right hand at the top of, on top of the left. Then Svastika, Svastika, and the left foot is placed a little downward between the right thigh and shank, and the right foot is placed in a similar position between the left thigh and shank. That sounds a bit like Siddharsan to me. Um, Dandarsan, this is pretty straightforward. Sitting with the thighs, shanks and feet stretched straight along the ground, with the ankle, ah, this is different though, the ankles joined together but the toes kept apart. So the legs rolling out somewhat. Ah, now this one, we've got some pictures to go with this one. Sopa Shraya supported. So sitting can be challenging, particularly if you're going to do it for a long time as an austerity. Um, so perhaps you don't want to be quite so austere. We'll see that quite a few of these um, people practicing these austerities did actually um, take support, a bit like having a backrest to your chair. So if we could have the first Krishna, little image of Krishna, um, so a it says in the commentary, Sopa Shraya supported tiger skin, deer skin or cloth is used to sit upon. And again, I think this is Vyasa, says support such as a yoga belt or, oh no, sorry, Shankarya, support such as a yoga belt or crutch. Okay, well, we'll look at this guy first. He's a Tibetan from, it's an 18th century picture illustrating a 15th century text. So you, he's doing pranayama, the, those little clouds are his, his prana coming out of his mouth. And you can see he's got a, a belt, but it's more like a piece of cloth round his neck and round his ankles to support his ankles. I've tried it with a yoga belt and it's too hard. I would suggest if you want to try this in your own practice, you the, use a, um, a thicker scarf or stole rather than a yoga belt. It's a bit harsh. Um, so if we could see another of these Sopa Shraya postures. Doesn't really matter what order we do them in. Ah, this is my own photo from Hampi, which is why it wasn't a very bright day. So this is Narasimha, the half lion, half man. And you can see, although he's a god and he's meditating for millennia, um, he's got a strap around his knees. But I read later that actually the strap has been several times renewed. He's 20 foot, two foot tall. He's carved from a single lump of granite. The carvings from Hampi aren't very sophisticated because granite isn't a very um, easy material to carve. And I also got quite excited. And if you can see, he looks as though he's got bricks under his legs. But having read that the belt had been replaced or renewed or repaired, I thought, hmm, I wonder if those bricks are actually just stopping his legs uh, falling to the ground. It could be just to keep the, the statue intact. So I wouldn't say that was evidence of using bricks under the legs. Um, so if we have the next one. Ah, Krishna, this is obviously a much more recent painting, but here he is, he's blue. And he's sitting on his tiger skin. And I don't think he's even got a little pole in front of him. And in some of the nut paintings from is it Rajasthan, Corinna, the nuts. Do you remember that wonderful show at the British Museum? Certainly North, Northwest India. Um, they're often shown with crutches and it's a straight pole with a little, um, almost like a platform. And I wonder if it was to rest your chin on so you didn't sort of hurt your neck if you fell asleep while you were meditating. Um, so that's the other thing. And uh, there is a yoga posture that commemorates the use of um, crutches. So if we could have the pictures of Guruji, Mr. Iyengar now, should be two of them. Ah, here we are. So this is called Yoga Dandasan. So the belt is called a Yoga Patta, double T, Patta. And this is a Yoga Danda. Danda means a stick. 
Um, so here he's using his body as a prop. I don't know if he invented it. I haven't seen it. Uh, we might spot it later. And then he had a great sense of humour. There's also a humorous take on Yoga Dundas. So we could have the last one of this little group. Yeah. So he's fallen asleep using his own body as a, as a prop. I just love that one. Um, he, he was a great joker. Okay, so this is Sopashraya postures with support. Um, now these Kruncha, Hastini and Ushtrasan, they're all named after animals, but they're the seat of the animal. They imitate the sitting posture of a heron, an elephant and a camel. And remember the elephant, we'll see the um, seat of an elephant again later on. Um, I think we'll move on now. Just trying to see the clock. Oh, we're okay for time, I think. Um, now, I think I've mentioned already that Patanjali has become the most cited reference um, in modern yoga systems. Um, and then the next text you might look at if you're a keen student are the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, the Geranda Samhita, um, the Shiva Samhita, those are the first ones I looked at. Um, and I looked at them because I got very cross. I don't know why I did, but I did get quite cross when James Mallinson started saying, well, of course, um, all the yoga postures, all these modern schools of yoga do, mat yoga, as they sometimes call it, um, are a modern invention. They're not yoga at all. They're not yoga postures. They're modern inventions based on um, uh, modern um, uh, body systems, you know, gym, um, uh, yeah, um, that it's, it's copying Western uh, body training practices and that the only old postures are static seated postures and I don't know why I just wanted what we do when we take our mats go to a class do our practice I wanted it to be old there's a kind of patina there's a kind of a, a glow of um, extra importance or sanctity that it, that's imposed by sheer age um, but actually, I think we'll find um, that um, as more and more research is done, that many of the um, postures do go back a long way. Oh, I know what I was going to do at the beginning. I was going to ask you just to think of the first six poses that pop into your head. So just take a couple of minutes. You've got a pencil handy. You might jot them down or just think of the first six yoga poses you think of or particularly like. We'll come back to them later. Okay, you've got to think of a card, any card, don't show me, just remember it. Um, so we're going to come on now to an area that I'm much less familiar with because around 600 AD, something like that, um, uh, the, the third strand of um, asana uh, became more prominent. So I've already talked about the completely static postures, the held postures, standing one arm up in the air, both arms up in the air, holding a stick up in the air. And then the third strand is um, the tantric aspect. So what is tantra? Um, if you know your European culture, it's a bit like the difference between Apollo and Dionysus. So rather than the sort of sun god, um, everything very pure and fine, um, it's Dionysus, it's um, uh, ecstasy, it's, not to put too fine a point on it, sex and drugs and rock and roll. Um, so Tantra is about transformation, like yoga. It's about attaining bliss, it's about attaining liberation. Um, there's a lot of emphasis in Tantra about opening the third eye, which is between your eyebrows, which gives you sacred vision. And um, there's also the theory that if you want to break 
samsara. So it's again like yoga, its purpose is to break the cycle of reincarnations. That um, you have to exit through the sahasrara chakra, you know, the chakras, the energy um, centers in the body. And the last one is in the crown of the head, thousand petaled chakra. And that when you attain enlightenment, you then your spirit exits through the um, that chakra. Um, so the means are often physical and ecstatic um, and transgressive, um, sexual union, drugs, literally, um, or alchemical transformations. The um, uh, tantric thinkers were very keen on um, trying to turn base substances into gold, um, mercury into gold, um, and also about attaining immortality, which like Western um, uh, beliefs about alchemy um, uh, were about attaining in, um, immortality um, or at least long life. Um, but I think the idea of Kundalini is not common to European or even Arab views of um, alchemy. Um, so you have these, in theory, you have these energy centers running up the spine. Classically, I think there are, usually they're represented as seven, but um, uh, Krishnamacharya, Mr. Iyengar's guru, lists 10 in his book, Yoga Makaranda. Um, and then you have a coiled serpent, three and a half coils of a serpent at the base of the spine. And you do various, very physical, as well as mental and pranayamic exercises to arouse the snake, the Kundalini, and drive it up through the chakras. Um, so it can be done through breath, it can be done through asana. Um, just to backtrack a little on some of the um, more transgressive aspects of um, Tantra, um, the idea is that everything is sacred, everything that exists is sacred, even the unclean. So um, by breaking, as it were, the norms of, of um, behavior, um, you can eat and drink unclean substances, you can have unclean practices, um, and you can also seek immortality or long life, um, even through asana. So if we look briefly at some of the medieval texts, you'll see that several of them claim that various poses will confer either freedom from all disease um, or um, even immortality. Um, one of the poses that's, that's chosen is Vipari to Karani, um, which is simply, they're all very simple descriptions. They're just placing the head on the ground, raising the body in the air. So you don't know if it's Shirshasan, you don't know if it's Salangasan, um, and our Viparita Karani is, is obviously rather more um, refined. Um, Gita wasn't very keen on Westerners getting too um, hung up on the chakras. I, I've got some recordings of her teaching Pranayama, and it's one of the sessions when, it, I think it's March, when all the Westerners have gone home, and she's only talking to the Indians, the um, the people who teach and assist at um, the institute in Pune. Um, and she teaches a pranayama session where you, uh, she teaches um, drawing the breath up and she does actually go through the, she doesn't name all the chakras, but that's obviously the principle of the class. Um, but she then says, um, I don't like doing it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Um, it's a very old CD, I'm not even sure I can get it to play now. Um, she, she more or less said, I don't like teaching this when the Westerners are around because they don't really understand it and uh, they get a bit funny in the head if they do too much of this. I think her feeling is that Indians are familiar with the concepts that they're not going to go overboard on it, whereas Westerners can um, induce disturbed mental states by going too much into chakras and kundalini. Um, and Desika Char, the son of Krishnamacharya, so he's actually Miss Dryanga's nephew, um, in his book, um, A 
about his father and his father's teaching, Krishnamacharya. He claims that if you if um, you get the energy to rise up, it should be prana, the energy in the body that rises up the spine and um, into the head, and not Kundalini. He almost sort of says, don't, you know, disturbing Kundalini would be like poking a snake. It's dangerous. So focus on prana, not Kundalini should stay in its place. It shouldn't be encouraged to break out and rise up. Okay, so there's lots of evidence from the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages, Middle Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, um, that do seem to be more um, tantric. Um, tantra, some of it is quite transgressive, smearing yourself in the ashes of the cremation ground. Um, if you attend a cremation in India, you're told as soon as you get home to wash all your clothes and wash your body and put on all clean clothes. It's it's um, the idea of covering yourself with the ashes of burnt bodies is um, uh, quite unacceptable in um, certainly in the Iyengar circle. Um, but there are names of some of the tantric deities, so if we could have Bhairava. Now, um, who's sort of the equivalent of Shiva and is often represented in statues as very ferocious. So this is Bhairavasan. This is a limber young lad from Krishnamacharya's day. And then if we could have the picture of Guruji, the next one in um, Kala Bhairavasan, black Bhairava. So that's a pretty fierce figure. So that's very much a tantric deity. Um, and also um, Tantra, I've only read about this very recently, it had a right hand and a left hand. And I'm sorry to anyone who's left-handed, it's really unfair. But left-hand Tantra is seen as being the really literally physically transgressive. Whereas the right hand, it's more sort of symbolic that you don't actually do all the dreadful things. You just sort of have them as ideas, notions that help you to break what keeps us um, locked in the cycle of samsara. Um, and of course, the Bhagavad Gita is very much about purity, duty, detachment. Um, and so is, but there are just hints in the Yoga Sutras. Sorry, I forget, forgot to get out my own copy. Um, but um, there is, of course, a section on the if any of you attended the last talk I gave, which is about chapter three, which is all about the attainments, the vibhutis, the accomplishments, um, the powers of yoga, which we see as magical, miraculous, impossible, um, however you want to see it, um, but potentially lists them all. Um, and it was, again, one of the things that Tantra was trying to achieve, like flight. Remember, was it David Icke who did that yogic flying? But Tantra definitely wanted to attain um, translocation, bilocation, being in two places as at once, flight, um, um, and these uh, miraculous powers. Um, so there's a listed in chapter three, but then the warning comes, uh-oh, this is not the way to go. You'll lose your way. You'll get sucked back into um, samsara. And actually, the very first verse of chapter four, which I meant to look out, says that you can also attain Kaivalya by Mantra, Aushadi, um, by chanting spells, by taking herbs, um, Samadhi. Um, so Patanjali does recognize that as one of the strands um, in yogic practice. Um, just a little bio. Shiva is, is reckoned to be the, the deity most associated with um, Tantra, whereas um, Vishnu, um, uh, of whom Krishna is one of the ten avatars, one of the ten incarnations, um, is more the deity that um, the Iyengas and Krishnamacharya hold to. And that's more the sort of um, spiritual disciplined path as opposed to Shiva, who's associated with burial grounds and hobgoblins and severed heads and, and so on. Um, 
Now, um, I talked about static poses and from about, I mean, lack of evidence doesn't prove that it didn't exist, but I'm only looking at the scraps of evidence I've been able to find um, in the few texts I'm familiar with. Um, so one of the earliest active poses that you couldn't hold for a very long time um, was the peacock pose, which is um, described in a 10th century text. It's a Vaishnava um, text. Um, it also describes Gorkas and put the right knee on the left knee, but we don't need to bother with that. So here we are, peacock posture. I wouldn't recommend trying this if you've just had Sunday lunch. Um, because it's obviously very strong on the abdominal organs. So it's the first really active pose that you could not hold for half a day or a day in sun and rain as um, we've seen for some of the other asanas. Um, and then the other, another one, um, oh, let's just have a look at the thunderbolt pose. This is called the Thunderbolt. Um, I had to choose this one because it's a back view. It's, we call it Baddha Padmasana, or Yoga Mudrasana in Baddha Padmasana. So it's the Yoga Mudra bowing down in the bound lotus pose. But um, in the old text, it was called Vajrasana because the Vajra is a Thunderbolt symbol, which is like a sort of crisscross shape. And so the arms crossing at the, at the back make a sort of a, an inverted triangle on top of a right way up triangle. Um, and then the last one in this section is um, Kukutasan. Here we go. So it's imitating a cock. So it's like a, can you picture those hens that have very feathery legs? So the arms are almost like the feathers down the, the hen's legs and then the, the two legs sticking out from below the, the body feathers. Um, Again, yeah, this is from a Vaishnava text. Um, now there's a, a project going on, which I've only just read about, and it isn't yet published, um, called the Hatha Yoga Project, which is uh, based partly at SOAS and some other um, academic institutions. And they are editing and translating 10 texts, some early, earlier than um, uh, things like the um, Hatha Yoga Pradipika and some later. And there seems to be an explosion of both asanas and texts as time goes on. That there are more and more asanas being described. There are more and more books describing them. Um, but there are also carvings. So let's have a look at some carvings. Um, so the first one I hope will come up next is the Mahudi Gate, which is in northwest India. It's late. 13th century. It's very degraded. Um, the article I read about it had photographs of the carvings, but they were so degraded that they were really quite difficult to make out. So the author of the um, uh, report on these um, carvings very kindly did these little diagrams. Um, and I chose, there are four diagrams, so you can imagine there are, um, this is only one of four and they all have at least this many carvings on them. It's a very elaborate gate. But I chose them partly because there's a female yogin, I suppose we'd have to call her right down at the bottom right. You can see her bosoms, but she's also got a strap round her legs, a yoga patta. And you can see there's a lot of use of the yoga patta. Um, and the things that look like bunches are actually foliage. Um, and then there are two upside down poses. And some of these would be difficult to maintain for any length of time. So uh, that's the Mahudi gate. Um, and then the other one is from Hampi. So again, these are quite difficult active poses. So here we are, I've got a hand balance on the left with both feet behind the head and just balancing on your two hands. 
Um, and then we've got an Urdhva Dhanurasana at the bottom. So again, not something you would want to hold for any length of time. Um, and there are lots more I could have shown you. Um, so now we're coming up, that, well, those can stay up for a bit so you don't have to look at me. Um, so we're coming on out of the Hatha Yoga Pradipika. Hatha um, is usually in the um, traditionally described as Ha. Ha Sun and Ta Moon, or the other way around, I can't remember. But modern, certainly Western scholars, describe it as the yoga of force. Um, they don't mention sun and moon at all. So it's kind of forceful practice. Um, and the Hatha Yoga Pradipika is by no means the earliest. The first one I quoted to the peacock posture was um, five centuries earlier. Hatha Yoga Pradipika is 15th century, but it's a real compendium. Um, very little of it is original, um, but it's just brought a lot of strands together, which makes it actually quite useful. Um, but the very first chapter, unlike a lot of books about um, asana and yoga, um, uh, the first chapter is the asanas, and then it goes on to the cleansing processes, the chakras, um, and it says in um, uh, that chapter. Asana is the first accessory of Hatha Yoga, practice to gain steady posture, health and lightness of body. And it lists um, a dozen asanas and it gives the benefits of some of them. Um, there's a Svastikasan, Gomukhasan, placing the right ankle on the left side and the left ankle on the right side. Ah, now listen to this one. Virasan. One foot is to place to be placed on the thigh of the opposite side, also the other foot on the opposite thigh. And then Kurmasana, Kukutasan. That's our cock that we just saw earlier. Um, ah, now just think about this. I'm not going to tell you the name. Just imagine what position or you can try if you didn't have Sunday lunch. And you don't have, have anything wrong with your back or your knees. Having caught the toes of both the feet with both of the hands and carried them to the ears by drawing the body like a bow, it becomes Dhanuras. So it doesn't tell you your starting position. Are you sitting on your bottom and pulling your feet towards your ears? Or are you lying on your back? and catching your feet behind you and pulling them towards your ears. It's called Dhanurasana, but it's really not clear. Um, and then this one, I can't, because I'm not, I haven't got you in um, grid fashion. I can't see if any of you are trying. So you can do it, and nobody knows you're trying. Um, place the right foot at the root of the left thigh and the left foot by the outer side of the right knee taking hold of the left foot, twist the body. Hmm? Matsyasana. And then this one, I don't think you'll have a problem with this if your legs are supple. Having stretched the feet on the ground like a stick and having grasped the toes of both feet with both the hands, when one sits with his forehead resting on the thighs, it is called Paschimottanasana. It kindles gastric fire, reduces obesity and cures all diseases of men. So these, you know, many of these texts make very extravagant claims. Um, there was obviously no advertising standards body in these days. Um, and then there's Mayuras and our old friend the peacock where you balance on your elbows. And now, oh, a new, a new entry at number 11, Shavasan lying on the ground like a corpse, removes fatigue and gives rest to the mind. The order is obviously, the order is completely random. You wouldn't want to practice in this order. And then number 12 is Siddhasan. By practicing for 11 years, yogi obtains success. It's a long-term project. And then Padmasan, Simhasan, the lion pose, and Bhadrasana, again, you might like to try this one. 
place the heels on either side of the seam of the perineum. Keep the left heel on the left side and the right heel on the right side. Hold the feet firmly joined to one another with both hands. It's like Virasana, but sitting on the, the shins and the feet. Um, oh, and here we are. It's a mudra, not an asana, Vipurita Karani. Place the head on the ground and the feet up into the sky. For a second only on the first day and increase this time daily. Banish it, it banishes grey hair and wrinkles. And practice for two hours daily, it conquers death. Um, but as I say, you wouldn't want to practice in that sequence, except maybe doing, but then Vipraj Karan is in a different part of the Hatha Yoga Pratipika because it's classed as a mudra, not as an asana. So it doesn't actually go in with all the other ones I've, I've written for you. Um, so 15th century Tibet. Now the text is 15th century and the pictures which Angie is going to bring up for you in the moment, in a moment are actually 18th century. So the text is called Secret Key to the Channels and Winds, Nadis and Pranas. So that's, um, that fits in with yoga um, philosophy as well. The, the nadis, the channels in the body, and the pranas, the five energies in the body. Uh, so it's secret key to the channels and winds, pem limpa compendium of enlightened spontaneity. Now it's a vast work, and the paintings are from the Dalai Lama's secret potala at the very top of the Dalai Lama's palace in Lhasa. And um, it starts with a lot of the things I spoke about earlier, the um, sort of the whole reality of, of human, of, of all existence, not just human, um, sexual union, conception, birth, disease, decay, um, destruction, death, um, and working through to um, things that bring you closer to enlightenment. Now, there are 23 moves, and you have to read them from right to left on the top, and then left to right in the middle, and then again from right to left on the bottom. This is only half the page. I'll show you the other half, or get Angie to show you the other half in a minute. And a lot of them are, um, they're a bit like the things I can remember doing in PE um, at, at um, junior school, rolling the shoulders. Um, shaking the legs, shaking the arms, turning the head this way and that. Some of them are rather more vigorous. I recommend, wouldn't recommend doing them, stretching your arms out and then bringing your hands back and vigorously striking your heart center. Um, I think you would only do that if you were, um, your heart had stopped and you hadn't, didn't have a defibrillator. Um, but there's lots of arm movements um, to the right, to the left. Um, not, not so many of them stretching up. Um, if you look down at the bottom, you can see somebody doing Shanmukhi Mudra, and it's described in the text as the first two fingers on the eyes and the, and the thumbs in the ears and the second two second set of fingers on the nose. So it's it's uh, it's blocking the um, all the apertures in the in the head, and then the chappy holding his leg is is bending his legs and then shaking them. Um, Okay, so we can move on to the next screen, please, Angie. And this is the other half. So again, at the top, there are these warm-up exercises, throwing the arms this way and that, and also twisting the trunk this way and that, twisting, turning. Um, now, I don't know if you can make out, but the chap at the bottom who looks, can you see he looks quite hairy? One who's sitting in, I think it's lotus pose. Yeah, that's the one, quite hairy. Um, and he seems to be balancing on his hand. So that could be um, Tolarsen. And then the chap lying on his back, who looks as though he's sort of curled up because somebody's tickling him. The instructions actually say that you roll on your back and you come forward to touch your head to the ground in front of you. 
and then you roll onto your back and take your feet over your head to touch the floor behind you. So that's something we occasionally do when we're doing a, a, a quick sequence. Um, and uh, actually, I think when this chap looks as though he's in Uttanasana, but the instructions for one of the ones on the first page that I showed you, actually from standing up, you bend down and take the hands to the, to the ground with a, uh, an exclamation of ha, and you do it nine times. So it's like Tadasana, Uttanasana, Tadasana, Uttanasana. Um, and then if we can move on to the jumping Tibetan. Okay, so I don't know if you can see, he's sitting on a pile of leaves or grass. And the description, because there is a text that goes with it, is that he crosses his legs um, and jumps up in the air and then falls down on his bottom. Now, there was a show long, long ago at the Wellcome Institute where they had some very jerky, very early black and white film footage taken by, I think, British army officers in Tibet of somebody, um, uh, a Tibetan uh, monk, doing exactly that. He had a little square cushion, quite deep, several inches deep, and he'd jump up in the air, cross legs, and then sit down, bump on his bottom, and then stand up, jump up, cross his legs, and sit down. He was just doing that repeatedly. And again, this is um, a tantric uh, action to move the kundalini up the spinal column. Um, Oh, and then if we can move on to, um, oh, the reason I wanted to show you the hairy um, Tibetan was that later on we might see if there's a link between the postures that we've uh, inherited, as it were, from Krishnamacharya and um, Guruji. Um, there are similarities, um, but Mallinson, when he was talking about this in his book, The Roots of Yoga, actually said, oh, well, the they're all um, they're all Tibetans. There's no evidence of any link with India, and the links are much more likely to be with China. But Tibetans are relatively hairless, and Indians are hairy. And if you could see the whole display at one, you'd see that quite a few of them are actually have quite a lot of body hair and beards. Ah, they had to keep warm. Possibly, but Guruji for cold actually recommends poses where you roll up in a ball. So um, the tortoise pose and the sleep of a yogi where you put your feet between your, behind your head and your arms around your body. So you're rolled up into a tight little ball so you don't lose heat. Um, so these two chaps, one is in the pose of a rishi, which is the squatting, not unlike what Mahavira did. And the other one, this is called the, the elephant pose. And I don't know if you can see their faces, but again, very often they have this fierce look, but I think it's just because they're doing this squinting that we saw mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. Even. Um, okay, so um, how are we doing for time? Uh, so I can't really see my clock. About three o'clock? Yes, so I need to move on. Okay, Iranda Samhita, Shalabhasana, locust pose, lie on the ground face downwards, the two hands placed on the chest, touching the ground with the palms, raise the legs in the air one cubit high. So they're not raising the trunk, they're just raising the legs. Ushtrasana, camel, uh, this is more like Dhanurasana, lie on the ground face down, turn up the legs and place them towards the back, catch the legs in the hands, contract forcibly the mouth and the abdomen. Oh, supine padmas and supine lotus pose, it says, gives psychic powers and destroys all diseases. Um, there's a lot of about destroying all diseases. Um, and so it goes on, 13th century, oh, 18th century, Jonathan Duncan, a British official, um, spoke to somebody called Puran Puri, who had decided to practice austerities, and of the possible 18 austerities, he chose Urdva Bahu, keeping the arms up in the air. The first year he had great pain. It was less in the second year 
and in the third year he was reconciled. He travelled to Malaysia, to Moscow, and he kept his arms up for 45 years. He could have chosen Kapali, I think that's the skull pose, placing a betel nut on the ground and standing with the head on the nut and the feet in the air, but that's not what he chose. Um, oh, here we are, 18th century, Sundara Deva, dynamic moves before you do pranayama, which of course we're told not to do. We're told don't do energetic poses before you do pranayama. So this is the head and trunk rotating and rolling, stretch the legs on the ground, put the hands on the mid thighs, lying back, raise the feet and quickly take them backwards over the head, over and over again. So again, this is rolling. Um, so early 19th century, 90 poses, repeated and rapid moves, lying on the back, holding the knees, rolling or rocking, um, standing and jumping like the Tibetans. Um, ah, now, I would really like any of you who are up for it to try this. Lie face down. No, nobody moving. Okay, you'll just have to imagine. Put the toes pointing downwards on the ground. Plant the palms of the hands at the crown of the head. Raise the bottom and look at the navel. Yeah, can you picture what position you'd end up in? Okay, now, so you're in sort of an inverted V shape. Bring the nose to the ground and take it up to the hands. Do this over and over again. This is called Gajasan, which um, is another word for elephant. So this is the elephant pose. So I think it's imitating an elephant lying down and then standing up. So if you can picture, you know, ungainly four-legged animals, if they, if they get down on their front, they have to do this sort of rocking movement to bring themselves up. You might want to find that on YouTube or something. Oh, and there's also padahastasana when you put the hands under your feet and then you walk about, which doesn't sound very jolly. And also climbing ropes. Okay. So now we're going to leave Sanskrit for the first English and modern Indian language texts. Um, so... Surya Namaskar, sun worship, gazing at the sun or moon is mentioned in the Tibetan sources. Now, Gita taught, in one class I was in, she taught a kind of prostration where we went from Tadas into something a bit like Malas and, and then sort of going towards Adumukha Virasana and then putting the hands beside the head and bowing the head to the ground and then coming back up, standing up and repeating it. And she said, that is the Vedic Surya Namaskar, salutation to the sun. And Vedic, of course, means um, pre-writing. That means many hundreds of years BC, maybe as much as a thousand years BC. So they're the oldest Indian scriptures. Amazing. They memorized books and handed them down for hundreds and hundreds of years when India had lost writing because the Indus Valley uh, script disappeared. And they really only got a viable script in about 300, 400 BCE, the time of King Ashok. So they remembered, memorized, and then transcribed things that in languages, by the time they were transcribed, the languages were antique. So it would be like an Italian having memorized um, the Aeneid or you know, one of the Latin, or a Greek, a modern Greek who'd memorized Homer and passed it on from generation to generation. And then finally, when you got a script, writing it down. Astonishing. Um, so we come to Surya Namaskar and the Raja of Aund. So Aund is a, now a suburb of Pune. It was a, a fairly impoverished little princely state. And the Raja of Aund, um, was born in 1868, um, died, um, well, I don't think it's written down when he died, but in 1923, he wrote a book in Marathi. So if we could have the Surya Namaskar now. Uh, 
Now the Raja of Aund was, he was the third son, so he didn't expect to become a Raja. And he was very keen on wrestling. There he is on the left. Um, and Indian clubs and the Indian um, physical exercise of rope, swinging on ropes and climbing on ropes. Um, but he was taught the Surya Namaskar by his father. And he claimed that his father had practiced it for 55 years. So he must have started it in the middle of, you know, something like the 1850s. Um, so if we move on down, so this is his son, Upper Pant, standing in Tadarsan. Um, I'd like to read you his description of Tadarsan first, because this is real yoga instructions. So the stance should be like a plumb line. Stiffen the whole body beginning at the feet. Push them into the floor as if taking root. Stiffen especially the waist at the back, control the abdomen. Feel the middle of your spine move back and the base move forward. Make the spine as straight as possible without raising the shoulders. And then if we move down to the next picture, with the knees straight, drop the hands to the floor, exhale very, every last atom of air. At first you can bend your legs. Throw your head down, try to touch the knees with the forehead or nose. Go down with an exhalation. And now he, he actually suggests when you're learning the moves that you just do Tadasan to Uttanasan, standing up to bending down and learn to do that first. And you can repeat just that. And if you remember the 23 Tibetans, they recommended doing that nine times. And then we move on. So he then goes into a lunge. This young man was 23 and he was an ambassador. To, he was in the embassy in, in um, London. So if we can move down to the next screen. He then takes the second leg back to join his leg, first leg to the second leg, um, which looks very much, it doesn't have a name. He doesn't name it. And then he lies on his tummy with the abdomen and the um, pelvis off the floor and the chin off. And then I'm afraid I've missed out the one that looks like Urdhva Mukheshvanasana. Um, and then he um, reverses the whole cycle um, and goes back again. And his advice is that you build up to Surya Namaskar. So children could do a dozen, uh, a fully grown adult who's fit could do 300. And it's done with three breaths only. So you hold your breath in some of the poses. He's very precise about placing your hands exactly where you place them on the mat so you don't slip. And he criticizes his son for having his heels slightly up, but says because it was in unfamiliar surrounding, he wasn't quite warmed up. We have to pardon slight inaccuracy. So he's being critical of the poses. And there's actually two photos of them. Uh, an English journalist, young woman in a bikini, and he's very critical of her poses. Her back isn't straight, her legs aren't straight, her, her body is rounded in Uttanas and the back should be flatter and so on. Um, so when did all this happen? This was published in Marathi. Oh, now this is really tricky because I've relied on the Times of India and I think they've got it wrong. There was an article just before um, International Yoga Day last year in the Financial Times of India, where they said it was published in 1923. But my copy, which I've temporarily lost, but it must be in the house, had it down as being published in Marathi in 1928. Now, the Raja showed the series to the Congress leaders, who, of course, were really almost like rebel leaders at that time, because it's 20 years before Congress took over when the British left to partition it they became the ruling power. He was very keen on uh, the um, on Mahatma Gandhi. Um, he had a cine film made of it and he toured Europe with his cine film. And that was when he met this Western journalist who wrote several articles for the News Chronicle. And then he published a book in English in 1938. Um, and there's evidence from the 1930s of schools in Bangalore and Mysore practicing Surya Namaskar and also practicing yoga exercises, but as separate disciplines. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, oh, one thing I must tell you, if any of you have been following Prashant at all, he recommended once you're proficient in this cycle, this linked cycle of Surya Namaskars, that you should say a, a syllabus, a, a, a syllable, each time you come back to Tadas. So the first one was Om, and then you do your cycle. The next one is Ah, which affects the ribs, the alimentary canal, the upper lungs, which get cleansed. And then next time you've done your cycle and you're in Tadas, and you say Harim, and the throat, palate, nose, and upper part of the heart are exercised. In the next cycle, you start with krum for the liver, spleen, stomach, and intestines. In the next one is hrim for the kidneys. In the next cycle is krum for the rectum and anus. And the final one is praha, which vibrates the chest and throat. And um, those are actually the main vowels of the first part. They're the first few letters of the Sanskrit alphabet first class of vowels. Um, so just to notice that when I talked about the Vedic Surya Namaskar that Gita described in one class we did, which was sort of standing, kneeling, bowing your head to the floor and coming back up, the Parsis were seen doing that in the late 1800s in Bombay. And William Dalrymple described how He'd been told when he did a tour of monasteries in the Near East that early Christians did a similar prostration and then they dropped it when um, uh, these prostrations came into Islam. And it's also very similar to the Islamic prostrations. So we have to gallop on now to Krishnamacharya. This will be our last main port of call. Um, so we're coming to Krishnamacharya. Now, Krishnamacharya was a Vedic scholar. It was an antique language, even when it was written down. It's very difficult, almost pre-Sanskrit. He was Mr. Iyengar's brother-in-law, and Mr. Iyengar was sent to visit him in 1934. But by that time, he had been to the borders of Tibet and Nepal, I think. So if we could have the map. Um, he spent seven and a half years in Tibet, near Mount Kailash, by the Lake Manasarovar. So that's a little map of where Lake Manasarovar and Lake Mount Kailash are. Mount Kailash is really the mountain for Indians. I think it's where Shiva spent thousands of years in meditation and um, I forget which of his wives, he had a succession of wives, got very fed up and actually fashioned her, her, her own child to keep her company because he'd been gone for so many years. Um, so he studied yoga there by, can we have the lake now, Manasarova, with Sri Rama Mohana Brahmachari. And then he returned to Mysore in 1922 doesn't that look beautiful? Beam me up. And he travelled around South India teaching asana, having been told to by his teacher, although he was a great Vedic scholar and had mastered every one of the um, ancient Indian scholastic um, skills. Um, his fate was to be a, a, an asana yoga and a yoga teacher. And he published a book called Yoga Makaranda, the... Um, fragrance of yoga in 1934. So that's later than our um, Raja of Amd. And it includes jumpings from Adho Mukhishvanasan to Chaturanga. It has this, what we call, vin some other schools call Vinyasa. Um, and Guruji, uh, Mr. Ayenga must have turned up in, um, and spent two years studying with his brother-in-law, who's much older than him, um, from 1934 to 1936. Um, but there's one last mystery, so if we could have the last Krishnamacharya. So 
So where do these come from? We've seen nothing like this. We've heard about rollings, we've heard about jumpings, we've heard about going from arms up, standing to going down to Uttanasana, but we haven't seen Parshvakonasana at all, anywhere. But at WOMAD, when it was still in Reading, pre-1996, I can't place exactly when, there was a programme of dance from Orissa, and it was all flowing movements, but at one point I thought, my God, she's in Paravrita Pasha. Oh no, she's she's come out of it. So this dancer flowed through some of the poses we know, including Paravrita Pasha, which is the revolved version of this pose. Amazing. And then one more. Uti to Trikonasana. Now, Krishnamacharya, I've heard, was the first to turn the foot out. Now this looks awfully like some of those Western exercises. I can remember doing something like that in school PE, except that we swung around it something a bit like revolved triangle. But um, I've been told, I can't remember where I heard or was told that Krishnamacharya was the first person to the front, turn the front leg out and Guruji was the first person to turn the back foot in somewhat to give stability. Um, so there is a bit of a mystery over these standing poses, but I just want to quote from Yoga Makaranda. He says that um, these gyms, um, they want us to import costly aids and instruments to practice these gymnastic exercises. They're anti-limbs. They can lead to weakness, paralysis, even death. And then he goes on to say, this is Krishnamacharya, foreigners steal works and techniques. That's certainly true of our 400 year shameful occupation of India. Um, and then pretend that the Western foreigners, he doesn't say British, but the foreigners steal works and techniques, pretend they discovered them, return and sell them back to us. That's certainly true of cotton goods. Paisley pattern, we stole it from the Indians. We made it in Paisley in um, Scotland and then sold it back to the Indians. They may do the same with our yoga techniques. It's a bit of a warning, isn't it? Okay, well, I think that's the end of my talk. How am I doing for time? I can't see the clock from here. I'm not wearing my glasses. Um, so what's the contribution of Guruji? His book, Light on Yoga, 200 asanas. Um, he covers philosophy, theory, asana, breathing techniques, mudra, kriya, um, but also the quality and the precision of the asanas. And now if you open any yoga magazine, any yoga book, what do you see? You see the warrior poses, you see triangle, you see stretched flank whatever you call it. Um, so I'd just like you to reflect on your six chosen poses. How many of them are actually standing poses? If you could just sort of hold up, you know, was one of them a standing pose? Were two of them standing poses? Were three of them standing poses? Quite a few, yeah, at least two standing poses. How many people had dog pose head down? Just put your hand up if you had dog pose head down. Yeah, so we've inherited a lot from the past, but some of it, we don't quite know where it came from, but we know what it does for us. We know how much joy it brings us. Um, I think that's, I wish my clock showed up on my um, screen. I don't know why I can't see the top. About six minutes to go, Sally. Six minutes to go. Um, Okay, gosh, I must have rushed through. Wow. Um, so if maybe we could just see that last little clip of wrestlers. This is wrestlers in India exercising. And it's a video clip. So I found this using the Indian term for exercise. Actually, that's you know, another one they did. Um, was there another one 
Was that the only one that came through, Angie? No, I think that was the only one. There was another one which really struck me, but it was much um, bigger wattage or whatever, not wattage, you know what I mean, um, too many bytes, um, which showed a whole row, in fact, about three rows, neatly aligned, quite sort of military looking, and they were doing Adamuka to Urdvamuka with jumpings, and they had their hands on house bricks. And I thought, wow, something has gone into Iyengar yoga and then it's come back from Iyengar yoga to um, these modern young men doing their um, drill before they do their wrestling. Um, so uh, it's a tangled cloth, the fabric that makes up our yoga practice. Um, now, I haven't been looking at the chats. Perhaps I should be doing that. Um, we have seven minutes. Any other messages? Any comments? I'm always confused by the word stitty. It seems to have multiple usages. Can you explain it simply? Um, star, I think, means to stand. It's a bit like the Latin. I think sto stari stitty startum, the four forms of the Latin verb to stand. But it can also mean stability, because if you stand, you're stable. Um, whereas if you're running or walking or whatever, you're not stable. Um, or state. It can mean the state you're in, I think. I'm, I'm not, I should say, I'm not a Sanskrit expert. I, I had lessons for a year. I had, was it an hour, our lessons with um, Arjun, Professor Arjun Wadka? And I travelled up to London, had an hour of Sanskrit lesson and then an Arson class and then travelled back from London to, to Reading. And I did my homework on the train. Um, and I wasn't a very diligent student. I was yo teaching yoga and te school teaching. Um, anything else? Gosh, I didn't expect to finish a minute or two early. No more questions? I've got a question. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that, you know, the clip of Indian wrestlers doing what looked like asanas, you know, we don't know if they got it from yoga or yoga got it from wrestlers. They um, looked like modern young men. Um, yeah. They looked absolutely contemporary, but who knows? But the fact that they had their hands on house bricks and people always said that our yoga bricks are based on the Indian house brick, the dimensions that we, we use for ours, whether they're cork or foam or whatever, it's based on the Indian house brick. I, I just loved it, but I have no idea. We'd have to go back and find the person who filmed them and ask yes, um, <laughs> or ask their teacher. The, it could also be that Western forms of exercise also went in there and came out, went in and came out. Mm, mm. And well, both, both, both the Raja of Aund and Krishnamacharya were absolutely adamant that they were against gym practices. They really didn't approve of it. And Guruji didn't either. He said all this running irritates the heart muscle and, you know, um, yeah. Um, the, in the Indian army, quite far back, they did similar. They sort of martial arty, but also a lot of yoga poses. You're aware, I mean, I do know that Guruji was involved and he always said, uh, I give them virasana after long marches and things like that. But do you think there was something already traditionally in there or was it Guruji? Or no, I think it was traditionally already in there. I mean, when I, 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 I did Google, um, oh no, I think there was a program note about the dance of Orissa that the, the, the dance form of Orissa was based partly on Indian martial arts. Mm. Uh, and I, I don't know anything about Indian martial arts at all, but the little that I know about other forms of martial arts, Taekwondo and those, is that they all have a kind of a spiritual discipline as, as one of the aspects. It's not just about eating other people. It's not just about defeating the opponent. It's a, it is a... Um, a mental and spiritual discipline as well. Talking about Virabhadra, when I went to Hampi, I, I took a couple of photos of a, um, carvings of Virabhadra, not in not in Virabhadrasana, 
but just as a deity, just standing there with his big club, looking very fierce. Um, because, of course, he was created to avenge Shiva. So again, there's a touch of the tantric about that. Um, so those, uh, any of the warrior poses, I think, well, the very fact that we call them warrior because Virabhadra was a warrior. Um, yeah, it's, it's a weave. I don't think you can say this is this, this is this strand, this is that strand, and never the two shall meet. But there are people who know a lot more about it than I do. And when, the, when they've finished this, I think it's a five-year project at SOAS, this um, Hatha Yoga project, um, we, we may know a bit more. Um, it'll be very interesting as and when they um, get it in print. Somebody's waving a book at me. Uh, no more questions? No? Well, you might like to lie down and do Supta Baddha Konasana or um, Shavasana for a few minutes just to rest your brains. Yeah. Uh, certainly what I'm going to do. No, I've done this. No, actually, I'm not. I'm going to walk across town to give my daughter some broccoli. But um, it's because it's sunny outside. But then I'll do Supta Baddha Konasana. Well, thank you all for staying the course. Um, I threw an awful lot at you. Um, I hope it wasn't too much. I'd be very interested to know um, there's not much in the chat box about people having felt overwhelmed. Um, yeah. Anyway, thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your Thanks, Sally. Yeah. Thank you, Sally. That was Bye. Thank you, Sally. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Very Lovely to see you. Bye. Thank you.